commentator is Fulton Lewis, Jr. Braving and fighting through the troubled waters of the North Sea off the coast of Norway, British land, sea, and air forces approached the Nazi-held islands of Vagso and Malloy. Sheltered outposts for the Germans, ports of call for their transports to take supplies to the Arctic Russian front. Their bows digging into the mountainous seas, the British warships forge ever ahead. Below decks, Britain's trained commandos make ready for daring action. They know that a dangerous job lies ahead. Officers map last minute details for the devastating assault, while others keep watch as dusk approaches. As the curtain of night falls over the grim scene, prearranged signals are flashed with complete understanding for unified action. Little do the German conquerors realize that Britain's commandos are coming, coming to wipe them out. As they approach the Nazi dominated coast, these daredevils eagerly await the signal that will set them in furious motion. Every movement is timed to a split second. The final signal is given. The men move to their post and through the black night, powerful batteries trained on enemy shore defenses shatter the stillness of the Arctic. Very lights flash the welcome signal, cease firing. Completely caught by surprise, there are no return volleys from shore. Britain's naval gunners have silenced the Nazi guns. Advance guards, daredevils all, silhouetted against the fire of burning buildings, pave the way for their comrades to follow. Communication wires are strung, ammunition is safely cached, explosives are hidden in strategic places. Everything is made ready for the landing and for the serious business that lies ahead. The RAF lays down a smoke screen to shield the approaching assault boats from enemy machine gun fire. The commandos land with grim determination to wipe out every vestige of German and twizzling occupancy in the islands of Vagso and Malloy. Cameramen follow, risking their lives to record this amazing film document for all posterity. As the surprise Nazis retreat, bullets whistle through the air and flames turn buildings into white hot furnaces, destroying everything and everyone within their walls. The main objectives of the invading commandos are Nazi ammunition stores protected by enemy machine gun nests. Now the sappers lay down more wires with dynamite on the business end. The sappers move on, more quick jobs to be done, more Nazi storehouses to be demolished. This German gun will never bark again. It's one of scores that fall before the might of the British Blitz. The fires light up the islands like monstrous torches. The devastation is beyond belief. There go the oil tanks, valuable to the Nazis for refueling shipping that now will never set sail again. More oil, gasoline, and the commandos know what to do over the side and down to the bottom.
In the center of town, the Nazis made a last stand to protect their headquarters, but all in vain. The commandos overwhelm them. Assault boats are abandoned as reinforcements come ashore. More commandos to carry on the winning fight already at its height. There's no time to care for casualties except their own. On both islands, complete destruction of military objectives is the achievement of the day. The commandos quickly master every objective. News is flashed to the warships. They move slowly, daringly through narrow waters to take up new battle positions. 16,000 tons of shipping slated for the Russian front is blasted from the bay. German airplanes take to the air. Guns from the British ships in the harbor bring one down. Nazi headquarters is the target for these blasting mortars. And still they come, and still they fight. The Nazi commander falls. Quislings carry his torn body to the boats. Two raids and two Nazi garrisons are captured in less than 10 hours. Take no pictures, reads the sign, but the victorious invaders take and give everything. In this raid, the British have two great objectives, to hearten the Norwegian people and to destroy Nazi shipping. The whole attack is an example of masterfully coordinated action between the commandos, the British Navy, and the RAF. The raid parties started to land at 8.30 in the morning, and by 3 o'clock the same day, they were on their way back home. Their mission accomplished, their victory won. Their timetable was rigorously kept. Back to the waterfront they march, back to the staunch assault boats that brought them to land, back with their wounded comrades. War strategists term this assault the model of its kind, and well they may. German prisoners are herded aboard British warships, glad to be rid of fear and uncertainty, while their homes and barracks are still ablaze from the commando's fury. On they come, more Tommies, more prisoners, and with them a mixture of Nazis and Quislings. Amid this havoc, hundreds of Norwegians eagerly join the British as friends friends willing and anxious to take up arms against their defeated conquerors. More prisoners and gone are the promises of their Vera. Gone are their hopes for victory. Completely surprised and trapped, they surrender their all. Offshore, warships load their strange human cargo while Norwegian pilots stand by the British navigators on the bridge ready and eager to help negotiate the perilous channel. As the ships are filled, anchors are weighed, and last preparations are made to sail away to home waters. More commandos reach the port, and with them more prisoners, the soldiers headed for Blighty, the Nazis for concentration camps. Trip after trip is made to bring all aboard. Commandos, loyal Norwegians, Nazis, and their quizzling followers. As all look back to shore, the telltale fires blaze a victory message that never can be told or written. Victory with a capital V, and one that will be recorded indelibly in all history. The intrepid bagpiper who led the commandos in battle now leads them in a dance of joy. It's a well-earned diversion they seek, a deck of cards in a friendly game, or restful sleep, or a trip to the barber. Hail to the commandos, brave, happy, victorious men. With them, it's thumbs up and well earned.
Britain's gallant 8th Army roars over the ancient and arid terrain of North Africa in their decisive thrust from Tripolitania to pierce the Marath line and blast their way to Gabes to drive Rommel and his armies into the sea. Under a troubled African sky, General Bernard Montgomery continues to be master of all that he surveys. General Fontoma, Rommel's second in command, routed out of Libya and with his back to the jagged walls of Africa's desolate coastal range, surrenders with his beaten and shell-shocked troops to the victors. Films captured from the Germans show Marshal Rommel at a more tranquil moment. Little did the Desert Fox then realize that the hunters were breaking through on all fronts. Meanwhile, convoys of fighting Yanks sail into an Algerian port with supplies and reinforcements. They've run the gauntlet of enemy U-boats and bombers, but again they're targets for another Nazi barrage from the air. The enemy scores with direct hits. Supply ships burst into flames. Stores and ammunition burn fiercely as landings are successfully made amid the hail of shot and shell. Then from the west, United States, British and French forces continue their thrust in a great pincer's drive to further harass the trapped Axis armies. American paratroopers leave an Algerian airfield for a mission on the Tunisian front. Over German bases in North Africa, Yankee paratroopers in actual attack as Signal Corps cameramen record the daring exploit of airborne infantry sent ahead to establish strategic positions where allied mechanized units will meet in a rendezvous to plan further advances. Artillery rolls on over hurriedly constructed bridges, inevitably east toward Tunis to threaten a 200-mile coastal strip between allied forces in the north and west and the victorious British 8th Army coming up from the south. In supreme command in North Africa is General Eisenhower, General Ike as his men like to call him. Word is passed, the battle is on. American tanks forge ahead over the barren plains, over rough and tortuous terrain. Now the Allied forces jab at the Axis flanks to slash through to the coast. The United States Army meets the Germans in full-scale combat in a weird arena west of Kasserine Pass. Here they fight it out gun to gun and tank to tank. Here the Allies hand out a foretaste of greater battles to come. Into Allied territory come troops of Rommel's North Africa Corps, not as conquerors, but as prisoners headed for internment camps. Allied fighter planes climb into the dry air like desert condors to engage the enemy in dogfights to the finish. The morning silence is slashed by the shriek of Nazi dive bombers as they unload their deadly cargo over Allied ammunition stores. A thousand fires flare as American, British, and French soldiers salvage whatever they can, evacuate the base, and move to safe positions. The tempo of battle increases over a vast wilderness of hills and deep ravines. Yankee planes look down on great smoke plumes rising from quiet olive groves in which are hidden tanks, guns, and Nazi foxholes. Flying squadrons climb above the battle-scarred planes, then sweep down in hedge-hopping thrusts to hammer more trucks, tanks, and men as they lumber toward Sidi Bouzid and Gafsa.
now they head for the sea, for Nazi transports and battleships, firing straight and sure into the vitals of the prowling enemy. Captured German films show the onslaught of Hitler's second gamble in Russia that was to be his greatest disaster. Oil stores go up in flames as the hard-pressed Russians leave only the funeral pyres of a great industrial city. The Nazi cameramen photograph only scenes that show irresistible might. The so-called Invincible Army moves in to smash all resistance before the gates of Stalingrad. Flamethrowers and grenadiers advance against the stubborn resistance of heroic defenders. And these films are to picture a great German victory, but Russia is yet to be heard from. Then comes the bitter cold of a grey dawn in November. A breath-freezing cold. This is the hour for which the Red Army has waited. Over the frozen earth, an avenging post sweeps forward to close an iron ring around the stunned German hordes. Hitler hadn't promised them this. Every pocket of starved, half-frozen Nazis hidden in the rubble of Stalingrad is blasted without mercy. The swiftness of the Russian counterattack takes street after street, squeezing the enemy into a hopeless position. Twenty-two Axis divisions are caught in the great bear trap Hitler himself had planned. And then the beginning of the end. The ruins of Stalingrad disgorge a beaten army. Under the white flag, they emerge from the ruins of the city. Too callous to salute a fallen comrade, Nazi Lieutenant General von Daniel and his staff, commanding the veteran 376th Division. A beaten host that hobbles along, many of them on frostbitten feet. Lieutenant General San, who blitzed Belgium and France, but now his blitz has backfired. He is but one of 24 generals taken. Here's Lieutenant General Schlemmer, who helped conquer Holland, with his entire staff commanding the 14th Tank Corps. And Lieutenant General Moritz von Dreva, who invaded Greece. Von Daniel and his aides arrive at Soviet headquarters to be questioned and they seem in no great hurry to face this ordeal. The Nazi salute is conspicuously absent as they play parts in a drama written by Hitler and revised by the Red Army. The biggest catch of all, Field Marshal Friedrich von Paulus and General Schmidt, his chief of staff. The Field Marshal has plenty to answer for. Von Paulus, during the siege of Stalingrad, gave orders that no prisoners were to be taken. He is questioned by his Russian captor. Berlin claims von Paulus was captured only because gravely wounded. Gravely worried might be more accurate. And here are the tattered remnants of a once proud legion that goose-stepped for Adolf Hitler, plodding toward a Russian prison camp. From all quarters of the battered city, Axis prisoners stream in to join the parade of defeat and disaster. At last, the German invaders do march through the city of ruin and desolation, but its defenders can hold their heads high. The free world salutes heroic Stalingrad. Stalingrad.